Welcome to the Same Side Selling Podcast. I know for our regular listeners, this is going to be a big shocker. I'm your host, Ian Altman. I hear from people all the time, struggles with employer retention, employer recruitment. How do we make it so that we don't have high turnover? And I've invited someone on today to talk about his latest book. This is my friend, Joey Coleman. Now, I've known Joey for years. We've spoken at many events together and I consider him the world's foremost authority on customer experience. And he wrote a Wall Street Journal bestselling book called Never Lose a Customer Again, which as I've shared it with my clients and we have several mutual clients, it has transformed their businesses. And based on demand from his own customers and readers and his audience, they said, well, how do you do the same thing for employees? And Joey has now created a book called Never Lose an Employee Again. And as I read through the book, I thought, wow, this is really brilliant stuff, and it's something that I need to share with our audience. So without further ado, let me welcome on Joey Coleman. Joey, welcome. Ian, thank you so much. So appreciate the kind words of introduction. I got to say, I get the chance to be on a lot of podcasts, never with someone that looks or sounds as good as you. So it is a thrill <laughs> to be on the show. You definitely have a face for radio, and I'm excited to be here <laughs> and get the chance. I'm just teasing, ladies. Ian and I have known each other for, geez, probably a decade plus at this point in the game. And uh, it's just a real treat and a real honor. And thanks for having me on the show. And thanks to everybody who's listening in and watching in. Hopefully we can have a great conversation that'll help you think a little differently about how you find, recruit, onboard, train, and ideally retain the best possible people for your organization. Yeah. And it's, and it's amazing insight that you share because like I said, people always focus on, oh, I'm just so upset because people leave and they, and, and I invested all this time in them. And then of course we have the great cliche, you know, what if I train them and they leave? You know, what if you don't train them and they stay? Right. That's 100%. That becomes, yeah. that, beca that becomes a problem. So I know that you did some, a, a fair amount of research and you access a lot of research on this. And many times people say, oh, the reason people are leaving is because of money. But your research says that's not always the case. In fact, it's not usually the case. Ian, you are so right. And in fact, it, I'm not at all surprised that you cut to what I think is probably the most telling statistic in the entire book. When you look at the research that's been done on why employees leave, I'm a, I'm a recovering attorney. So the first step's admitting we have a problem. There's 11 steps after that. But given my legal training, I'm always looking at how rigorous was the research? What is the level of intentionality that went into the study that someone's quoting? And most studies that are done on why employees leave have a sample set of somewhere between 300 and 500 respondents. And that's fine and dandy, but anybody who's listening or has any familiar familiarity with statistics knows that that's not a really big sample set to be basing your business decisions off of. So what I went and did is I sought out the largest study that's ever been done of why people leave. And I looked for the most rigorous approach. And I found some work done by the Work Institute where they interviewed 234,000 employees that were so leaving on, their let organization. Just, let me interrupt. So 240,000 employees, which for those people keeping track at home is more than 300. Yes, it is. Okay, yeah. just making Sli sure that slightly, people follow it. Slightly larger. It's a rounding yeah. error, right? <laughs> slightly larger and across 17 industries globally. So this was a gigantic study. Oh, and by the way, last thing, the study was done by a third party, not by the employer. Because what do we know is when you're leaving and your employer says, why are you leaving? It's kind of like in the relationship when you say, oh, it wasn't you, it was me. And it's like, no, it was you, but I don't want to tell you that because I just want to try to end on a nice note. Moral of the story here is here's what the research found. What the research found is there, is there are indeed a percentage of employees who leave because they get a bigger paycheck somewhere else. And the percentage of employees that that applied to was 9%. 9%. Less than now, one out of 10. Correct. Some people look at that and they're like, oh my gosh, we're losing 9% because of the money. What I did is I said, huh. Why do the other 91% leave? Because if I can solve that problem, it doesn't matter if my competitor can throw more cash at them. It doesn't matter if some outside influence or VC funded firm can come to the table with bigger packages in terms of salary and benefits. 
what can I do to keep them? And what we found, what the research found, was that almost 24%, almost a quarter, 3x basically, the amount of people who left for money left because they didn't have a clear vision of their career going forward at that organization. Basically, they didn't know what their next promotion or their next opportunity looked like in the organization. When I realized that, Ian, I thought to myself, wow, if we could just solve that singular problem, we can keep a quarter of the people who are going to leave from leaving. Yeah. And that solution does not require lots of money, lots of effort, lots of focus, three new hires, a new department. It sure. just requires a little intentionality. Well, and it requires asking the questions because oftentimes what people say is, oh, well, then what we should do is when we bring people on, we should tell them what their career path is instead of pausing and saying, well, what do you envision for yourself? Because let's face it, if you tell that new employee, oh, in two years from now, you're going to manage a team of people. And that's their biggest fear in life is that two years from now, they're going to manage a big team of people. You're basically just encouraging them to leave. Now, they're out the door before it's even started. Exactly. Now, now, speaking of turnover, you also shared some interesting stats, I believe, from Sherm that talked about the percentage of people who are actively looking for other positions. Yeah. So the good news here is, folks, uh, in 2023, again, globally across all industries, it is only the case that 65% of employees are actively looking for a new job. That's it. Yeah. Just more than <laughs> half of your people. Just, what just two is, thirds. <laughs> just two thirds. That's it. And what's fabulous is when I, when I speak to audiences around the world, when I consult with companies, one of the things I'll always ask the leaders, and I'll be doing this in a room full of employees, I'll say, it's great. Just look around and decide which half of you isn't going to come back after lunch. Then add a couple more people, and that's who's going to be in the room when we reach the end of the year. And practical reality is losing that percentage of people or even having that percentage of people thinking about leaving. What do you think that does to your engagement? What do you think that does to your morale, your productivity, your efficiency, exactly. the experience you're creating for your customers, moving towards your goals for the year, for the quarter, for the week? It absolutely is decimating emotionally and practically to the operation of your enterprise. Yep. So, so Joey, in your, in your research as you've done this, I, I want to first think about kind of the interview process. So now, uh, now I'm looking to attract candidates. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you saw businesses make during the interview process? Because I've got some opinions about it, but I know you did a way more research than I have. So, so what are some of the mistakes that you see people make in that interview that starts things off already on the wrong foot? Ian, I think this is a great question because if we don't go to the beginning of the journey and start to make repairs to the experience there, we can't just hope to fix it once they're in the door. We've got to get earlier upstream, figure out what the problem is. And so what we found is that there's a couple of key mistakes that many, if not most organizations make. The Let's start at the 35,000 foot level and then we'll drop down to get real tactical and granular. At the 35,000 foot level, the biggest mistake organizations make in what I call the assess phase, when a prospective employee is assessing whether or not they want to work at your organization, is that they are not showcasing what it will actually be like to work there. All the communications are based on, well, this is what we stand for, and this is what we serve, and these are the clients we represent, and this is the salary you'll be paid, and these are the hours you'll work, et cetera, et cetera. And those things are important. But what's more important is what will it feel like to go to work? Who will I actually be working with? What are my coworkers like? What's my team like? What's the culture like? The secret in this assess phase early on is to think of ways to creatively showcase to candidates what it's like to be an employee. Now, to get a little more tactical, a couple of things we want to do. We want to think about honoring and respecting the candidate's time. If I see one more job description that says salary commensurate with experience, what that says from the very beginning is we're going to make you go first. We're going to make you say, and I know we've got the same side selling folks listening in. We've got all kinds of folks that have unbelievable sales experience. And the practical reality is 
for years, we had this thought of, well, if you make the other side go first, that's a great negotiating tactic. Not in 2023 and not with your employees. It's just not. Give them a range. Give them an idea. Make it so that before they even hit submit on a resume or an application, they know if they're within the band of what you're looking for. Because not only is it respectful to them, but it protects your time and your team's internal operations. Secondly, get smarter about interviews. Stop asking the same old boring questions in the same old rote way. And number three, figure out ways. This brings it back to that philosophical thought, but we can be more tactical in it. Figure out ways to preview what it's like to work with you. Have them interview not just with the HR department, but maybe with some of the people they'll actually be working with. Consider getting interviews that happen not in a conference room, but over lunch, at a ballpark, get them out and get a feel for who they are as a human being and let them see who you are and who your team is as a human being. It will change the dynamic. It's interesting. It's interesting you said that because I believe one of the big traps is that too often the hiring process, because of people's regulatory concerns and things like that, has become so clinical, if you will, and so sterile that It makes it so that there's no emotion, there's no connection. And of course, the reason why people stay is because they're emotionally connected to the personality of the business and the other people. And in fact, I had an arm wrestling match with one of one of my clients about this very notion. I said, look, create a video, create a short video that just says, so here's what a week in the life of this role is like, and we're going to take you around and guess what? If this looks like the kind of thing that would be fun for you, we'd love to talk to you. And if not, then like, it's not going to change dramatically. So here it is. And this is the experience. And by the way, here's my approach as a manager. And the things are important to me. If those things are important to you, we're probably going to get along great and have that kind of low key. Just here's what the, here's what your life is like. The other thing that we've done, because you've heard me talk about the client vision pyramid in sales, the idea of, gee, when people are looking for help in this area, they're usually looking at one of three levels. You have the effective, enhanced, and engaged level. For my clients on the recruiting side, we call it the candidate vision pyramid. And the way we describe it- I'm guessing it might have a couple different levels. It has three different levels. (laughs) And the idea is- Three, that's weird. I wonder where that came from, Ian. And and the, (laughs) the idea is that this is something that, and I'm curious to get your take on it, and and we've had great results, so I'm pretty sure it's okay, but what we do is when a candidate comes in, we say, look, so when people are looking for a new role, they're usually looking for a place that delivers an experience as an employee at one of three levels. The base level, effective level is, look, I just do my job, I get paid, I go home, I don't have to worry about stuff. The next level is, look, here's a clear path for career advancement, for personal development, things like that. The highest level is, this is where the business takes a holistic approach to making sure you don't miss soccer games. Whatever is important to you, we're hitting on those things. Which level are you looking for? And what happens is, they now get candidates who say, no one else I talked to cared about me beyond just the work stuff. I'm going to take this job, even though it doesn't pay as much as this other place, because I think I'm going to be happier there. And then what they also do is they they will now say, and here's someone who started in this role five years ago. By the way, they're now in this advanced higher level position, but why don't you talk to them about what their experience was like so that we're not just selling it clinically, we're showing them a path of succession and someone else who was in their role five years ago. So now they can say, wow, I can actually get from A to Z. And I'm not at all surprised that you came up with this brilliant pyramid model because you're brilliant. And the practical reality is, yes, this is how it works. When we treat our employees like adults and like human beings, Ironically enough, they want to treat us as their employers like adults and human beings. If there was one kind of key concept that I hoped people would take away from the book, it's this. If you have an intention of being a world class employer. I mean, a top of the line employer, the kind of employer that, you know, when you put out a job posting that you've got an available position, you're receiving a hundred applicants for every one open position where people love you. It's quite simple. You have to care as much about what happens between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m. 
in your employees' lives as you care about what happens between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Yeah. Basically, care about the aspect of their life that occurs when they're not at work, when they're not, you know, their significant other, their spouse, their children, their, their loved ones, their parents, their hobbies, their pet, all of these things that make them who they are as a human. Now, when I suggest this, lots of times the audiences will say, well, Joey, that sounds like spying or prying into someone's personal life. I'm like, no, it's respecting the fact that your employees aren't just drones, that they have personalities, that they have interests, that they have things that matter to them that go beyond the typical workday. Yeah, that's perfect. So, so now we've gone through this recruiting process We've got someone on board, and, and I want to make sure that we cover the eight phases of employee experience that you cover in Never Lose an Employee Again. But where do companies first fail when it comes to onboarding a new employee? Because it's something that I want people to recognize that, look, so you made the decision, you're going to hire them, and guess what? They accepted the role, and now that's where I find most companies actually totally screw up. Yeah. The failure in most businesses, if it didn't start in how poorly managed the interview and, you know, recruiting process was, and we could have a whole separate conversation for in a complete episode about the actual extending of the offer and how often that feels like it was written by a lawyer designed to cause pain as opposed to an invitation to come join the next chapter of your life. But by the way, in, in fairness, People often aren't sure if it was written by a lawyer or a dentist, but go on. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Very true. And then we come to a phrase that I'm sure folks are familiar with on the sales side, which is buyer's remorse. But let me introduce you, if I may, to a phrase you may not as be familiar with called new hire's remorse. And this is where the person who's accepted the job offer begins to doubt the decision they just made. It's scientifically proven. It's just like buyer's remorse. And we think about that in our own lives. You know, the time you might've accepted a job when you had a couple other interviews that were outstanding and you hadn't heard back yet, but you're like, oh, I've got to accept. Or you accepted after a little bit of negotiation, but you always wondered, well, could I have gotten more if I would have stuck with it? And that fear and that doubt and that uncertainty usually is paired with zero communication from the organization. Right? Because the organization says, oh, you accepted the offer. When do you want to start? Oh, I want to start three weeks from now on the 18th. Great. And then they hear nothing from their new employer until they show up at the office on the 18th. And surprise, surprise, guess what? Half or more of the time, the employer isn't ready for them. They didn't know they were coming. They don't have their computer. They're not set up. They take them to a lunch, you know, with a bunch of people that didn't even know they were going to lunch that day. And they're kind of clickish and talking to each other, not to the new employee. They maybe usher them into a conference room and say, hey, um, read through this policy binder and watch these videos we made in the 70s about workplace harassment. And uh, we'll be back to pick you up later. And then you sit in a room by yourself. I mean, the, the number of times that we fall on our face as an organization at creating an experience before they've even complete their first day on the job is staggering. And I think it's probably why 4% of all new employees, 4% will come to work for the first day, go home that night and never come back again. 4%. I mean, this is One unbelievable. One out of 25 isn't going to come back for day two. That's how bad day one is. There's there's opportunity for improvement, friends. And 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 I and I know Joey that everybody who purchases the book never lose an employee again. What I love is that they get checklists, they get worksheets, cheat sheets, tutorials, they get different examples in video and multimedia, they get all sorts of different case studies. And it's just you're giving people the tools to actually execute this. I, I want you to talk through quickly the eight phases of the employee experience. And I love the alliteration that you use in this, in the book, but just you know, talk me through these eight phases and briefly what they are. And I, I don't expect you to give everything away because people should get the book. Well, Ian, I'm happy to share anything and everything. Here's the thing. You are correct. There are eight phases. They all start with the letter A. And the reason they do that, not only is it fun 
alliteration, as you said, but it's also the opportunity for folks to recognize if you get each of these phases right, it's like getting straight A's on your report card if you ask the employee, what's the experience like of being here? So I'll go through all of them and we can dive into whichever ones you're interested in. That first phase is the assess phase. We talked about this earlier when a prospective employee is considering whether or not they want to work with you. They're checking out your job listing. They're going on Glassdoor. They're looking at your website. They're going through your interview and application process. They're kind of getting a feel for who you are as an employer. We then come to the accept phase. The accept phase has two elements. Number one, we decide and accept that this is the candidate we want. So we make them an offer. And number two, this candidate accepts our offer of employment. We then go to phase three, the affirm phase. This is that new hire's remorse stage we were just talking about, where the candidate, now an employee, begins to doubt the decision they just made to join the organization. We then come to the activate phase, phase four. This is the first day on the job. It's the only phase that lasts a single day. All the other phases are multi-day or longer. This is a one day chance to make a great, remarkable, experience anchoring, memory anchoring experience. But then Ian, we come to the phase where most organizations completely go off the rails. And that's the acclimate phase. Because while there may be one or more people at your organization involved in the day one experience of a new hire, if I were to ask anyone listening or watching, who's responsible for day two? Cue the tumbleweed, right? Exactly. No one's actually, the employee's responsible for their day two experience. So in the acclimate phase, which can last weeks or in many organizations, months, the new employee is getting used to your way of doing business, your cadence of communications, the type of tools you use, the way you interact with clients and external customers, the way you interact with coworkers and colleagues, your internal customers. Lots of stuff happening in the acclimate phase, huge opportunity to hold people's hands and help them navigate it. So we reach phase six, the accomplish phase, when the employee achieves the goal they had when they originally accepted the job offer. And if and only if they accomplish that goal, do you have the right, the privilege to welcome them into the adopt phase, phase seven. When they adopt your organization, they become loyal and committed to you. They're not answering the call from the headhunter or the recruiter. They are committed. And if, and only if, Ian, we've navigated through those seven phases, do we reach the holy grail, nirvana, the eighth phase, the, the goal we were all striving from for day one, the advocate phase where the employee becomes a raving fan, singing your praises far and wide, writing online reviews on Glassdoor and other sites about how great it is to work for you, actively recruiting their, fen their friends, their family members, the best people they've ever worked with in their career to come join your organization. What I always ask employers, Ian, when they ask about the advocate phase is, if you have an open position at your organization, how many referral candidates are going to come from your top performers in your organization? If that answer is anything other than the majority of them, you have opportunity to improve the advocate phase. Absolutely brilliant. And then I know you've got some tool. I mean, the, what, what I love about the book is that it's filled with examples, tools, the case studies that you have range from relatively small local companies to global brands that everybody knows. So no matter what size business people have, they can look at this and say, wow, that's a company about our size in a similar industry, in the same type of business, not just, oh, here's an example of what Apple does. I know that our, <laughs> right. our, 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 son, our son is starting a position and it's kind of funny because he, he starts a position in early August and the company said, yeah, well, after you join the company, then you can buy our merchandise in the employee store for half off, but you can't buy it before then. And I'm just shaking my head. I'm like, you want them to be wearing your swag before they show up. So they're excited before they get there. But okay, I guess there's, and I guarantee you there was someone in HR who said, well, we don't want to give them a discount. And then they end up, you know, not taking the job or, or changing their mind. It's like, yeah, because it would be happen? horrible to have your brand walking around the marketplace exactly. in a young up and coming coming, you know, new candidate. Oh my gosh, unbelievable. And here's I would even add on top of that, Ian, why are they even making the new employee pay for swag? It yeah. should be, hey, you want a t-shirt, you want a hat, you want a sweatshirt? We will give it to you. 
because yeah. you're offering to be a billboard for our organization. No, you're so right. And one of the things I do want to highlight, and I so appreciate the shout out about the case studies, Ian, it was really important to me to have the case studies in the book be representative of the different businesses in the world. And that's why you'll find over 50 case studies from all seven continents. I think of the first business book to ever have a case study from Antarctica, but there are employees in Antarctica. So we looked at some employee experience issues in Antarctica. Did you go visit? I did go visit. I actually, <laughs> you know, you got to take a trip to actually do an on-site <laughs> visit. So I did do that, I must confess. And what we found is the majority of the case studies featured are from companies with less than 100 employees. And the reason for that is the great majority of businesses on the planet have less than 100 employees. So sure, to your point, we can learn things from the Apples and the Amazons and the Googles and the Microsofts and the big corporations of the world. But I wanted to give ideas that people could say, you know what? I have 15 employees. The company in this case study has 17 employees. I bet I could afford this. I bet yeah. I had the resources to do this. And that was really important to me. And I like to think it really came through in the pages of the book. A absolutely. And, and Joey, keep in mind that I think that most of the things that the audience needs to realize is that the ideas that you're sharing, most of them don't really cost anything. It just requires no. some intentionality. In 100%. I think the average tool or the average technique that is suggested in this book to fully implement would cost less than $200 and taste less than a week. If yeah. your business can enhance your employees' experience for less than $200 of hard cash and less than a week of intentional effort, we need to have a bigger conversation about your business profit margins and how you're structured. So Joey, let me do a quick recap of the key points that I think we covered. I'll give you an opportunity for rebuttal, and then I'm gonna want you to share with people the, the best way for them to connect with you, where to find the book and where to learn more about what you're doing. So remember that through this process of our employee relationship, it doesn't end with them hiring. It kind of, it, that's like step two in an eight step process that we're gonna make sure of. The main reason why people leave is not because of compensation. That's less than one out of 10. It's more like they don't know what their career path is. They don't know what their future is. They feel uncertain that communication isn't so great. We know that 65% of employees are actively looking for jobs elsewhere, which means they may not be that satisfied. And we can usually solve that by asking questions about their goals or motivation. So we understand what makes them tick. And the favorite thing that you shared that I loved was care as much about them between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m. as you do about what they're doing from 9 to 5. And that's how you'll ensure that you never lose a customer again. And of course, we've got these eight phases, six tools to enhance that employee experience. So what did I leave out? I think you got it beautifully, Ian. No surprise there. Here's the thing, folks. I understand that it is difficult to be an employer in 2023. You've got a lot of things on your plate. You, the, the average employee doesn't realize how much their manager and their employer actually cares about them. I know a lot of business owners, I know you do too, Ian, who spend a lot of time worrying about how am I going to make payroll? How am I going to be able to continue to grow the business? How am I going to be able to take care of my people? The problem is the typical employee doesn't know how much the organization actually cares because we haven't taken the opportunity to tell them and to show them that they are valued and appreciated, not just with lip service, but with actual actions. So there is there are a host of things you can do to create remarkable experiences. You're only limited by the bounds of your own creativity. And my hope is that anybody reading the book or listening to the book, or even just listening to the podcast, gets some ideas, some sparks, some ignition in their own desire to go make better experiences for their employees. So Joey, fantastic. What's the best way for people to learn more about what you're doing? And to, aside from all the typical outlets, 
where should they go to get Never Lose an Employee Again? Well, the best place to find me is on my website, joeycoleman.com. That's J-O-E-Y, like a five-year-old you know or a baby kangaroo. Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, like the camping equipment, but no relation, joeycoleman.com. The book is available, and I want to shout this out in three different formats. So if you're all about the ebook, you're good to go on your Kindle or your Nook. If you'd rather have the hardcover book that you can take notes in and put on your shelf, you're taken care of there. And if you've enjoyed the conversation we've had, you can get the audio book and listen to the book. The book's called Never Lose an Employee Again. It's available anywhere where you might find books. I know you're probably going to go to Amazon. If you wanted to do a solid and go over and do something at Barnes & Noble, that could be interesting as well. Uh, but literally anywhere that you might, and your indie bookstores as well, let's support the bookstores that we love to go and browse in to decide what books we want and maybe consider making a purchase from there to help those businesses continue to grow and thrive. Joey, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and sharing this book that I know is going to have a dramatic impact on businesses and create a m remarkable experience, not just for their customers, which you've already done, but for their employees going forward. Thanks again, brother. Uh, thanks, Ian. And thanks to everybody for listening in. I absolutely loved getting some time to be on the show and appreciate you listening in and joining us. All right. Be well.